And I was talking about the fact that um, I often read in books that only 1% of the ancient Egyptian populace was literate and able to read and write. But we were just talking about how perhaps that's a bit more of a gray area. And Hannah's going to tell us more about that anyway. Hannah also does field work for the Met in New York. So um, first of all, I'll just hand over to Hannah to tell us a little bit more about her work. And uh, thank you once again for joining us. And thank you, everyone, for coming along today so much. It's great to see so many people. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, also, thank you for the, first of all, to Ramesses, uh, Sarah, Angie, and Annette for the invitation. It's great to be with you. And it's also incredibly encouraging to see so many people turning up on a Saturday afternoon when the weather is turning milder. So there is a lot of enticement to do a lot of things despite the lockdown and you voted for Egyptology. So that is uh, something I'm, I'm, I find greatly encouraging. Also, Sarah has set the tone for uh, a story of Egyptian writing and Egyptian graffiti by mentioning the literacy gray area in Egypt and also by having a wonderful hieroglyphs background. Uh, so that's uh, just the right start. Uh, thanks, Sarah, for introducing me. I'm trained as an Egyptologist and historian, so I do um, ancient Egypt, mainly New Kingdom history and uh, written culture. And also my training as an historian led me to do history of Egyptology. So essentially, I'm trying to understand what can we understand about an ancient Egyptians and how we go about it and how did we go about it in the past 200 years. Uh, so hopefully um, a tad bit of self-reflection in, uh, in Egyptology. However, today uh, I would like to tell you more about ancient Egyptians reflecting on their own culture and on their own monuments. And to do that, one of the very good approaches is to use the texts and figures we know as ancient Egyptian graffiti. And so I should start the presentation uh, now and hope that Zoom will behave, uh, or rather that my PowerPoint will behave as well. Yes. So hopefully you should see a full screen with two Egyptian scribes leaving their mark. This is an artwork by a, a good colleague of mine, Sarah Chen, who is the artist at the Egyptian department in the Met. Um, and there is a curious story because she was actually watching um, a couple of us at work in the department to sort of uh, do the, the cartoon figures of the Egyptian scribes. Um, and it's also derived from a real site, and you'll hear more about that site. Uh, the architecture is taken from um, the pyramid complex of a Middle Kingdom pharaoh, Senusret III, or Senusret Chaka Ra, as the Egyptians would have preferred to call him. And the scribes on the picture are um, our impression of how it might have looked like when the New Kingdom Egyptians, so like 18th dynasty, the time of Hatshepsut, when they came to see a Middle Kingdom pyramid complex. But more about it later. First of all, let's um, have a closer look at what the graffiti are, because they're by no means something special in um, ancient Egypt or even in Egypt talking geographically. Graffiti are widespread pretty much everywhere where you find people, you find graffiti. What does the term mean? Well, originally it has an Italian connection from graffiare, from scratching or incising something. And there is a lot of graffiti. There are a lot in the world that are carved like these uh, examples from various places in Britain, including the Tower of uh, London, the prisoner graffiti. So you get these scratched, incised, carved texts and also figures. Very often they reflect people's presence. It's the, the basically, it's uh, I, the I was here uh, impression. And people write graffiti in man-made locations like the walls of the Tower of London or the churches in Norfolk. But they also write graffiti in um, natural environment, in quarries, in mines, on rock cliffs. So there is a sort of a gray area, what do we call graffiti and what do we call rock texts and rock art? But essentially it's added figures and added texts in an environment where people were already active. So man-made environment with added inscriptions and added figures. That's, that's the situation when we talk about 
uh, graffiti. Uh, the Georgian graffiti in Kenilworth remind us that graffiti were left um, at different times, sometimes a very long time um, after a building was finished. This is Renaissance Castle and Georgian graffiti. And again, people notice their names and also the dates of their visit. And this custom is also observed in ancient Egypt. So it's a big tradition saying, I was here and when I was in that particular place. And it also means the place meant something for me because it, it mattered enough for me to travel and visit it. And I considered it important to leave my name. So that's something to remember about all graffiti across historical periods and across uh, different cultures. The example from the Norfolk uh, churches, one of the medieval graffiti from Norfolk, shows that people were not only writing, uh, writing their names, uh, but also they were drawing. They were drawing all sorts of things, but usually not at random. So what people depict is either themselves or other people or important objects or important beings. So in Egyptian graffiti, we find gods, animals, people, uh, and um, parts of animals and parts of people, literally very often human heads, just heads and faces. In other uh, contexts, in other cultures, under historical periods, there are other important things. Evidently, in uh, East Anglia, the important thing to depict in the Middle Ages was ships. Obviously, uh, the, it's, a, it's a trade, it's an important trade region. It has had, um, has had all the connections across the, the North Sea. So ships were definitely something important. The other interesting element about graffiti is that very seldom they come from just one historical period. For instance, the graffiti on the right hand side show you um, um, a layering like a like a layer cake of graffiti on an ancient Egyptian monument. You get the Coptic graffiti from the Coptic Christian period, uh, Middle Ages, the, the early Middle Ages of Egypt, and then after that, the 19th century travelers to Egypt. Uh, of course, graffiti are not only appearing in important locations like memorials and churches and um, tombs and temples. They appear everywhere. And we know that graffiti today are an important part of our urban landscape. We find people spraying and stenciling and writing their tags and we think, well, that's a sort of a vandalization of our urban space. But interestingly enough, even though we may not necessarily agree with all aspects of graffiti making in the 20th and 21st century, even these modern graffiti writers share something with their ancient predecessors, namely the wish to leave a mark, to leave their name somewhere, to make sure that they are remembered. It's kind of making your claim, this is my territory, I've been there. So. In that sense, street art and modern graffiti are continuing, however problematically, the legacy of ancient graffiti. And sometimes, as this slide is showing, graffiti have a really interesting life. Kilroy was here, is a famous graffito from the times of the Second World War, and it was left by the Allied troops across Europe. So it became a symbol of liberation at the end of the Second World War. And then, it became also a part of a monument, the World War II Memorial in Washington, DC. So it's a strange uh, thing when an ephemeral uh, element, ephemeral feature, such as a graffito saying Kilroy was here, became a symbol for its time, for the Allied troops liberating Europe. So the graffito got monumentalized. Uh, in a similar procedure, eternity, is a copper plate, originally chalk, chalk inscription, left by Arthur Stacy, quite a character in the Australian city of Sydney. And Stacy's eternity was left on the pavements and walls. And when Stacy died, the graffito became a symbol on his uh, tombstone or alleged tombstone. So again, eternity became a symbol for Sydney, like a sort of part of the urban fabric of the city, and it was monumentalized to um, remember 
the, uh, the maker, Arthur Stacy. So graffiti had really interesting lives sometimes. But from what I'm saying now, you may think, well, it's a really, really large territory, this graffiti. It's a catch-all umbrella. And yes, correctly, uh, correctly uh, spotted, it is a catch-all umbrella, and it does cover the ancient material, the 19th century travelers, the 20th century urban space, all the way to street art like Banksy or the tags of uh, the uh, youth um, groups, sometimes youth gangs in modern cities like the New York subway carriage is reminding us uh, of. And what is also important, graffito is not necessarily only an individual statement, it becomes a symbol. We have already seen that with Kilroy was here, the second life of this graffito is that it became a symbol for the allied troops. But graffiti can also become a symbol for a political debate, even political activism. And Banksy uh, is quite famous for that. These examples reflect the challenges of politics in the Middle East, uh, in Palestine, um, the, the West Bank uh, wall. They reflect social criticism, the consumer culture in the middle, and also a political debate concerning Brexit is reflected in the Dover Brexit graffito. So political statements, not only individual concerns and claiming your territory, but also your social, cultural, political concerns get articulated in uh, graffiti. And it is the same across the ages. These two examples join uh, statements from the Arab Spring, the um, Kyrene graffito combining uh, the, the symbol um, for, well, anonymity and political liber liberation with the face of Tutankhamun. And on the other hand, in Pompeii, we're reminded that graffiti can also absorb a lot of cultural influence from their times. So they can, can quote literary works or theatrical plays. They can refer to works of art. Graffiti are really, really very, very lively, very vivid and sort of amalgamating pretty much everything that goes on in a culture or society that produces graffiti. All of that gets reflected in graffiti production, whether in texts, or in visual art. And the other interesting moment is that such ubiquitous texts and figures also have a catchment area. We've already seen that they appear in landscapes, especially man-made or man-influenced landscapes. They appear on buildings, they mark the presence of human beings, and they reflect on a number of opinions, concerns, and experience of people who were leaving them. And this reminder of the 19th century travelers making their graffiti um, is um, another important thing. Um, it's a reminder of the large catchment area that a graffiti uh, place could have had. So we have graffiti that are left by people who live locally, like people who left the middle, mid medieval graffiti in Norfolk, they were probably locals frequenting the church. People who traveled to Kenilworth were already Georgian tourists, and people who traveled to Egypt in the 19th and 20th century and left the graffiti on Egyptian monuments, they were spending quite some time, effort, and expense on their travel to Egypt. So Egyptian monuments and their graffiti have this large geographical uh, catchment area. And the tradition of important tourists and visitors in Egypt is not limited to the 19th or 20th century or even to the uh, modern era, but it is something that we know from the classical ages onwards. The fragmentary colossi of Memnon, that is the monumental statues of Amenhotep III on the West Bank in Luxor, the only extant remnant of the funerary temple of Amenhotep III, those colossi are covered in graffiti, including inscriptions reflecting the presence of the Emperor Hadrian and his entourage. So important uh, tourists and travelers um, paid attention to Egyptian monuments over the ages. 
And ancient Egyptians themselves, finally arriving to the gist of our talk today, they were no exception. What really helps in understanding the mass of texts and figures left in the Egyptian landscape and on the Egyptian monuments is their context. There are large projects studying rock texts, rock inscriptions, and rock art, and they work with a highly contextualized approach. That is, they look exactly at the location, the spot, and the landscape where people were writing and leaving their figure of graffiti. One such project is involved with the Theban Mountain, the West Bank, the cliffs around the Valley of the Kings, Valley of the Queens, and the village of Daryl Medina, and the uh, uh, area of Daryl Bahri. There are graffiti everywhere on those cliffs and their understanding is closely tied with our information, with our understanding of the village of Daryl Medina because many of these graffiti were left by people who lived in Daryl Medina and worked in the area of the Western Bank. So that is like a local imprint of an important community. And Daryl Medina was probably one of those exceptional Egyptian communities where quite a high number, a high percentage of people were literate, probably both men and women. And one of the reasons why we assume that is also their ubiquitous graffiti production uh, in the area of the Theban mountain. But graffiti are spread in many areas of Egypt not only close to the capital city like Thebes. The Egyptian landscape is full of texts and figures, and we can follow the movement of people in the landscape across the geography of, of Egypt. The other important bit uh, where uh, there are really many graffiti concerns the roads, the desert roads. For instance, the Yale University uh, Desert Survey is uh, following the Theban desert roads, so behind Thebes and towards Western desert. Another important search is on, uh, on uh, underway in Wadi Hammamat in Eastern desert. Again, the rocks in these areas are full of texts and full, full of figures reflecting human presence, reflecting religious life, people were venerating gods in the desert, reflecting people just stopping at a popular place, noticing quarrying and mining expeditions, trade missions, and so on. So graffiti allow you literally, it's like forensic evidence. You can follow people's footsteps using graffiti. And the same happens when we look at the monuments and what the ancient Egyptians left on even more ancient Egyptian monuments. This map gives you a very brief overview of major necropolis, major burial sites, and also temple sites with a large scale graffiti production. So Memphis, Beni Hassan, Asiud, and the Theban area. However, it's an incomplete map, and it gives you only the main bits where people were writing on monuments considerably more ancient. So that's why I've highlighted these sites. But graffiti on monuments appear everywhere. Aswan region, for instance, is another very, very prolific graffiti site. But today, we will look at the ancient Egyptians visiting the uh, important sites um, in the Theban, uh, sorry, in the Memphite area, not Theban. Theban area would require like a couple of hours just talking about all the diverse, uh, diverse groups of graffiti that we have there. So in the Memphite area, I would like to invite you to the place where the Metropolitan Museum is working, to Darshur, and to show you a little bit about uh, New Kingdom Egyptians visiting a Middle Kingdom pyramid complex of Senusret III. For comparison, and to conclude, we will also look at the graffiti in an Egyptian temple, in Abydos, not in the big temple of Seti, but in the smaller temple of Ramses II, but the graffiti there are no less interesting. So to start with, we move in the Memphite region on the pyramid fields, and in particular to Dashur, to the pyramid complex of Senusret III. This is how it, its plan looks like, and you can see that it is a complex, a, a precinct of a pyramid that hosts the pyramid itself, 
a number of pyramids of the queens and princesses, and also several shrines. The biggest shrine, the largest uh, temple-like structure, is the so-called South Temple on the left here, which follows immediately after the causeway. So immediately after people arrived to the pyramid precinct, they came to the large South Temple. And then they could continue via a narrow passage that you can see also there to the uh, pyramid temple proper and to the area of the uh, pyramid itself. However, uh, all of this understanding of how the architecture of the pyramid complex looked like, and indeed our understanding of the graffiti, is based on quite a large scale and painstaking um, reconstruction. Because what you see when you get to Dashur is this a pyramid precinct that's pretty much raised to the ground and the once imposing pyramid clad in shiny limestone is reduced to rubble, to a heap of mud bricks, to a mud brick core that originally was supporting the limestone casing. And also the shrines and the south temple and the causeway and the walls surrounding the pyramid precinct that was all made in fine limestone and the walls of those temples and shrines were all covered in fine limestone reliefs, polychrome. However, this is how it looks like when we're finding that material. This is a, a bit of an archival historical picture because it shows a magazine in the dig house at Licht. So material from Dashur used to be transported to a dig house at Licht. Now we have a new magazine the Metropolitan Museum has, in cooperation with the um, Egyptian um, authorities, built a new magazine in Dashur, the new research center, and all these fragments were therefore moved back to Dashur. But what did not change is the challenge we're facing here. All the wonderful limestone reliefs originally covering the walls of the pyramid sh shrines and the South Temple, they were broken to tiny pieces and we have to put them together. And it's only after these pieces are put together and the reconstruction of the original relief wall is ready, then we can plot the graffiti on them because on these fragments, there are dozens and dozens of traces written by mainly black and exceptionally also red ink. And they are usually written in hieratic. So essentially what we're trying to do, we're trying to understand the space of the pyramid complex. So moving from this, uh, from this completely uh, broken fragmentary view, to something like this. So essentially reconstructing the view of how it might have looked like. Uh, the top right, for instance, is a view that possibly could have represented the uh, pyramid temple. And the very, very colorful colonnade probably was extant in the south temple. So the colonnade was a feature, a very prominent feature of the south temple. It must have been quite stunning. So obviously some speculation and hypotheses are, are involved, uh, but we're having a pretty good idea about the pyramid complex and its uh, decoration. And this is how it looked like uh, when we first started finding these graffiti. James Allen started with the research in the 1990s. And there were some attempts earlier in the 1890s when the complex was uh, surveyed and partially excavated by Jacques de Morgan. So the graffiti research in the pyramid precinct of Sanusser III in Dashur has quite a long history. So Jacques de Morgan, Jim Allen, and then um, Felix Arnold and myself, we, are, we were faced with this fragmentary hieratic, so cursive, not hieroglyphs, but it's cursive hieratic writing, mostly in black ink. And many of these texts refer to people who came to see a temple. So they're not saying they came to see the pyramid, but they're referring to a hoot nature, to a royal funerary shrine. It's the same name that these New Kingdom visitors would have used for a memorial temple of their own king, such as Moses III or Hatshepsut. So they're coming to see a hood nature. And they're also 
coming to see a very, very identifiable hood nature. What you see here on the right hand side, bottom part, close to that red, um, red sign, there, there are three signs that look very much like the car hieroglyph. The sort of the black black um, uh, signs with with this with the outstretched hands and that is the fragmentary name of Senusred the third Ra is his throne name so the visitors from the new kingdom mostly from the 18th dynasty were capable of identifying the place as a funerary monument and they were also capable of identifying it with its historical owner correctly Senusred the third that is Senusred Chaka Ra. They also admired the place. They very often said that it's the most beautiful temple among all the temples. And they also stepped in the role of a funerary priest of Senusred III in the sense that they said the offering formula for the benefit of the king. So let the, 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 the car of Senusred III receive a thousand of pieces of bread, thousand bulls, thousand and all the good and pure things. Uh, so they were admiring the building, identifying it, and also performing the correct thing that one was expected to perform in a tomb place in a funerary monument, that is, offer to the deceased, to the tomb owner. Interestingly, they were also not only interested in Senusred, but they were also interested in the material remains of the uh, shrines and they were behaving in a certain way in different parts of the of the temples in the, in different parts of the pyramid precinct uh, this reconstruction shows you another uh, angle of view on the scribes writing in a space of a doorway and on the right hand side you see a very large fragment it's uh, well over five feet high also of a doorway Doorways or door frames were very often covered with graffiti. This is something we encounter in other monuments as well. So in this, in this sense, the pyramid complex of Senufred III is not exceptional. People write in door spaces a lot, presumably because they stop there and also because the door spaces were uh, having a sort of a flat and pale paint on the walls no reliefs. So if you were writing on a door frame, you were not conflicting with the original decoration. Now people could also write very close to the original decoration, but door frames, at least in the 18th dynasty, seem to be a preferred space. You can also notice in this reconstruction that the scribes are sort of high up, they are not on the original ground, they are on a layer of sand and debris. The location of graffiti on the walls can allow us to uh, assess this because the door spaces, also the columns in the temples were quite tall. Um, a usual door opening would have almost three and a half, four meters, a column likewise. And yet people were writing high up on the door frame and in the upper portion of the column. And they were writing on it while it was still standing. You can see that they were writing on it in, in a way that is practically only possible when the uh, building is still standing. So how come that the average Egyptian having a sort of, a, well, between five and six feet, how could they write so high up on the wall? So um, accepting the possibility they had a ladder or a scaffolding, there must have been a layer of debris, of sand. And this tells you something about the state of preservation of that temple, because it indicates that the temple was standing, people could still admire it and write on its walls, but it was not in full operation. It was not cleaned up regularly, there was probably enough sand for the writers to stand on and ride high up on the walls. The other interesting element that you can see on the right side on the doorway fragment is that it's covered by many, many lines of hieratic text. And it seems that they're not all written in the same hand. So what probably happened there that graffiti attract graffiti, graffiti create clusters. So people come and write where somebody else uh, already uh, has written. 
So that is something that happens with modern graffiti writers, and evidently it did happen in ancient Egypt as well. Sometimes people just added their names to somebody else's graffiti to piggyback on their presence, and sometimes they left their own, maybe even very repetitive. For instance, this doorway, it has about five or six repetitions of the same formula. And admired the temple, found it more beautiful than any other temple. And this is once again the more, more uh, sort of lifelike, imaginative reconstruction of scribes writing that they came to see and found the, tem found the temple beautiful and set the offering formally. These graffiti have a kind of a fairly strict uh, narrative framework. They have these, these anchoring points, there came, found it beautiful, set the offering formula. They're written in Middle Egyptian, so quite a high formal language, and they seem to be something that the scribes were learning. So it was kind of like the appropriate behavior in, in such a monument to, to leave a graffito. However, the graffiti are not only attesting to people visiting the temple, possibly for various reasons, maybe even to study the original decoration, but they also reflect the, um, the life cycle of the building. Because what we find in the complex of Sanusred III is not just the graffiti texts from the 18th dynasty that admire the temple and pay homage to Sanusred III. We also find a very different type of black ink, much larger and still hieratic and New Kingdom inscriptions. These Ramesside dockets, they're not written neatly tucked away next to the original decoration. They're not written neatly on the pale area of a door frame. They're written everywhere across fragments of stone across the original decoration, like this one. They're written sometimes in quite large signs, sometimes smaller signs. And what they say, they refer to temple buildings of Ramses II. So what might have been happening in the reign of Ramses II was a recycling project. That is, the temple of Senusred III was literally taken apart and its stone reused elsewhere. So that's where the life cycle of the building comes um, in, into its own. And these inscriptions are telling us how the perception and the use of the site were changing. So these are two more examples of the name of Ramses II in these dockets found on fragments of stone in the pyramid precinct of Senusred III at Dashur. And we even know who was responsible. The royal butlers or Idunu, that's a title that appears very often in context of quarrying. Royal butlers were not necessarily sort of chamberlains or somebody involved in palace service. They were very often people involved in various, uh, various jobs on behalf of the king. For instance, providing building supplies, so including quarries. In this case, the quarry was a pyramid complex, and these royal butlers left their names. Maybe they even took some of, their, of the stone for their own purposes, and the names were marking these fragments of stone. Interestingly enough, the literate uh, crews or the scribes who were managing the dismantling of the pyramid complex of Senusred III also had their own interests. They wrote prayers on the disappearing walls. They also um, even painted um, the, 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 the god Amun, the ram protomy, the ram head of the god Amun. So they sort of still considered the place a sacred space. It was still a temple, despite the fact that it was also being recycled. And this figure with the red splash of ink in front of his face is also a Ramesside material. It is a figure dressed in sort of the very typical elaborate Ramesside robe. He also has sandals and he seems to be gesticulating quite wildly. And he also has an open mouth, which is a signal of an emotion. Maybe he is shouting loudly. Maybe the splash of red was also given the ambivalent meaning of red in Egyptian culture, 
uh, indicating some sort of a, an angry involvement, like a fiery speech that this, one, this man was making. Maybe it was a caricature left by one of the scribes. Maybe it was even a caricature of one of the royal butlers. Even though in the realm of hypotheses, there is one even more tempting option. And that is, whilst the pyramid complex was being dismantled, the son of Ramses II, the famous prince and high priest Chaim Waset, formerly considered the first archaeologist, and now more seen in a more complex role, Chaim Waset left his monumental label on the casing of the Pyramid of Sanusret III. So you can imagine this complex situation. There are recycling crews removing the reliefs and taking away the fine limestone from the complex of Sanusret III. And at the same time, or roughly at the same time, another Ramesai dignitary, the king's son, Chaim Waset, is leaving a label. Like if he was trying to placate Sanusret III, we took away your temple, but I am, Memor sort of memorializing your name again in a monumental inscription on your pyramid casing. So graffiti in pyramid complexes, uh, illustrated here by the example of Sanusa III in Dashur, those graffiti can tell quite a vivid story of people visiting, admiring, there are even copying grids from the 18th dynasty, so copying monumental art, getting inspiration, and even playing their role in the uh, almost abandoned cult of the Middle Kingdom sovereign. And at the same time, these pyramid complexes could become not just a resource for uh, productive traditions, cultural traditions of the New Kingdom, they could literally become a resource for more building. So the material resource, uh, a strange sort of a quarry. And they could even become a, a place for people articulating their individual concerns, maybe even caricaturing their uh, superiors. Now we move to the comparison site that will give us a slightly different perspective. The pyramid complexes around Memphis were, after all, not entirely abandoned. They were surely known and people still found them very important in the New Kingdom but they were not fully operational temples. Could people write graffiti also in a fully operational, uh, let's say, quote unquote, new temple? Well, the simple answer is yes, but how did it work? We'll see, looking at an example of the temple of Ramses II in Abydos. Uh, I'm also working for the New York University on a corpus of graffiti in this temple. And it's a fascinating example. It's one of the many. There are many, many large uh, groups of graffiti. Utterly fascinating is the corpus in, in Thebes, in the West Bank Memorial Temples, but also in Karnak. And the fascinating thing with Karnak is that some of the graffiti in Karnak temples can be connected with important people who had monuments elsewhere, statues or even tombs in the dignitaries' necropolis in Western Thebes. Elizabeth Fruit from Oxford is working on this and she calls it a story map. You can recreate somebody's presence across all these different monuments. Um, so temple graffiti were really, really fascinating. The example from the temple of Ramses II in Abydos uh, mostly consists on, uh, of New Kingdom and Third Intermediate Period graffiti left in this Ramesside temple. So they were made quite uh, shortly after the temple was commissioned, or maybe they just followed as soon as the temple opened uh, for business. They are spread as these red markings on the plan of the temple will tell you, they're spread in a number of locations, in the courtyards, but also in some of the inner shrines. The placements of graffiti on the walls of this Ramesai temple also deserve some attention. Many of them are located very low on the walls, on the so-called dado or subasman, on the lower portion usually left undecorated. So you have the original plan of the Ramesai decoration up the wall and you have the secondary inscriptions, the graffiti on the bottom part of the wall. Well, this invites 
a question, was it because that was easily accessible or was it because it was allowed to leave graffiti in that location? Possibly the answer is both. So you may not see it quite clearly in the red uh, rectangle, but there is an engraved graffito there. And this is what it shows. The Temple of Ramses II in Abydos is the memorial temple of the king. And as these funerary temples usually go, it is a place to venerate not just the king, but a number of gods, Osiris, Onuris, and Thoth. And the god that was, is depicted in this graffito is Onuris, and he's surrounded by priests, their hieroglyphic captions say they're mostly priests, Wab, um, is surrounded by these priests offering to him. So it's a very interesting moment. Usually only a king or very highly uh, positioned royal person can offer directly to the gods. Ordinary people offer to the king in, in a temple setting, or they offer to the gods on their private stele. And here they're in a royal temple in a really highly important location. And these ordinary priests, not high dignitaries, uh, had depicted themselves offering directly to Onuris. So they, they're almost taking the cult of Onuris out of the inner shrines of the temple and luring it out to the courtyard, making their own miniature, miniature shrine in the courtyard itself, like they were appropriating a temple space where they were serving for their own, uh, for their own devotional purpose, for their own religious interest, for their own worship. The inscriptions in Ramses II are not all of them so conspicuous. Some of them are more hidden, like these ink written inscriptions in red ink, naming usually names and titles of people who visited the inner shrines of the temple. And here the process is different. These inscriptions are almost hidden in the rich, colorful polychromy of the original reliefs. So what you see here is an inscription in red ink from the late Ramesside period that had to be modified digitally to be uh, more, more legible. So it's almost like people wanted to be present in, in that shrine space, in the sacred space, but they also wanted to be visible only to the gods or maybe only to the select few. What these texts are saying, they're usually uh, either just claiming somebody was there or they are praying to gods like this one. They're asking for uh, protection, they're also asking for knowledge. So their they're, um, uh, scribes showing that they're interested in uh, not only the protection of the gods, but also knowing their scribal uh, jobs. And we're talking in this, this interpretation of the temple space as the lived religion. So it's not only that the temples were a magnificent stage for grand processional feasts and big uh, rituals performed by uh, the king. There were also places where more ordinary people, even ordinary priesthood, could have appropriated select locations within the temple, within the shrines, and some of them were more visible or almost creating like a mini shrine of their own, and others were invisible, but still taking part in the cults deep inside in the shrines of the temples. So even in a, in a let's say, a, a fully operational living temple, people uh, worked with the space and appropriated the temple space for their own purpose. And we will find across Egypt many such examples. People were, for instance, in Thebes, watching processional feasts from the roof, and they left their names and prayers on the roof such as in the case of the Honsu temple in Karnak. And we could go on and on and on with these um, examples. But what the graffiti really say, whether they are left in a funerary temple of a king who is long dead, or whether they are left in a temple that is in full operation, they show that the Egyptian culture was not limited to the elite and monumental expression, that people who are illiterate were able to leave their own mark, textual mark, expressing their presence, their literacy, their knowledge, 
and also their religion. That's why we talk about lived religion. And those who were not literate were, to a certain extent, capable of doing the same by using figural uh, graffiti. So this scheme is a bit of a, like looking into an Egyptologist's uh, workshop. This is what we try to do when we look at the ancient Egyptian graffiti. So we read them as texts and we study them as visual art, but we also try to contextualize them because a graffito really does not tell you all that much if you take it away from its wall and from its uh, overall location. What is also important is to think about the materiality, how people wrote them. For instance, we find that people trained graffiti signs. Next to the final text, you find training signs. So it mattered to them to make a good inscription. So they were really showcasing their literacy. And in fact, we do find an example of a critical graffito that says, somebody wrote really badly here and I, I just can't stand it. Um, so people debate their ability, or rather the, the writers, the makers, debate between themselves who is the best graffiti maker. So graffiti are best understood in their physical space, in their material um, appearance, but also as part of the intellectual history of Egypt. What I wanted to show you today was a couple of New Kingdom examples of how people um, articulated their presence and their concerns without being just kings and high dignitaries. Because many of these people, some of them were high dignitaries, that is for sure, and they do use those titles. But many of these people were ordinary priests and ordinary uh, scribes, that is, administrators. And many of them were not showcasing their social position, even though some of them were, and importantly so, but they were showcasing their literacy and their uh, religion. So it is, after all, the human presence that the graffiti enable us to follow. And with other artifacts, we sometimes have a difficulty, we're challenged to place a papyrus in the hands of a scribe, to see the papyrus in the workshop, or to see the furniture in its original place, to see a jewel being worn. We're trying to imagine when we find uh, the objects, the artifacts in their archaeological context, how it must have been when they were being used in their real life, in the lived context. With graffiti, we have an advantage. They are one of the few categories of ancient artifacts where we're literally stepping in the footsteps of those who made them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hannah. That was fantastic. Um, if anyone does have any questions, you can either write them in the text box here and I can ask them for you or unmute yourself and um, ask them yourselves. Hannah, do you, is there any evidence of anyone being punished for graffiti or does it seem like it was generally an allowed thing to do? It seems to be generally an allowed thing to do. I suppose one had to execute a certain discretion, hence some of the graffiti being uh, less visible than, than others. And presumably, depending on who you were, your access to different parts of the temple also uh, gave you the opportunity to leave uh, graffiti. Some people evidently even commissioned artists to make the graffiti for them, but generally, it's a practice that sort of regulated itself in different, uh, different locations and different historical periods, but there does not seem to be uh, the, um, the tendency to, to punish people. Well, people could criticize you for bad writing, as I, as I mentioned, but not punish you for the very act of making a graffito. Do you think that the evidence that you find in graffiti is more reliable than the monumental stela? Uh, I think they're part of one, one complicated and incredibly interesting network of artifacts. They're not really more or less reliable, they're just expressing different uh, facets, different aspects of, of somebody's uh, activities. For instance, we have, talking of the high dignitaries leaving graffiti, we have people like Amunajek, the royal herald of Tutmose III, uh, 18th dynasty. He left graffiti in Abu Sir, or Abu Ghurab rather, in the Santa 
temples of the old kingdom. And he also left a monumental tomb and he left monumental statues. And essentially, he kind of repeats the same framework. He wants to be remembered and he wants to be remembered as somebody who served his king, Tutmosis III, that is, very, very well and loyally. So essentially, he puts Thutmosis III in his tomb in Thebes and depicts himself as a loyal servant of Tutmosis. And when he writes the graffito in Abu Ghraib, he says, Amunejeh was here, and it was in the times when his majesty successfully conquered Syria. So the same process, you're stating who you are, you're stating where your legitimacy and your position comes from, it comes from your king, and you're doing it in monumental evidence, and you're repeating a very similar framework in your graffito as well. Do you think that the I was here kind of cultural meme originates in ancient Egypt? It's more likely that it just appeared parallel in many, many cultures. Uh, even though Egyptians were really prolific in, in the sort of scribbling on the walls, uh, people were and are scribbling uh, pretty much uh, anywhere and everywhere. And it's, it's, a massive, uh, it's a massive production of graffiti. If you, if you look at the Roman graffiti, for instance, that's uh, just um, an enormous, enormous corpus of material. And sometimes it's a very interesting sort of like a gray zone between what's monumental and what's non-monumental. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a ubiquitous practice. Do you think the idea in Egypt of the name needing to be carved in stone as a kind of um, uh, a sign of that name's eternity do you think that that is encapsulated in the idea of leaving your name in places? It's not so much about name being carved in stone. It's um, uh, at least where New Kingdom is concerned. It's very much about being written. I know this looks like a very strange nuance, but the point is written, not how it's written or whether it's carved in stone. Because a stone, as the uh, there is a text on Papyrus Chester Beatty number four in the British Museum, which is known as the immortality of a right of the writer, and it says every your tombstone can crumble. Your well. Their, it's sort of projected on the past. Their tombstones have crumbled. Their shrines are derelict. Their monuments are gone, but their name lives on because it's being written. Mm -hmm. So that means written anywhere and everywhere and written in um, literary compositions also and copied. But the act of writing was, was really, really important. Mm. And we spoke before we went online, we were talking a little bit about the perception of the average Egyptian um, when they looked at hieroglyphs and what idea they had about what they might mean if they couldn't understand them as writing. What are your thoughts on the experience of those people? Uh, that's, a, that's a very good question and I think it's one where we're still uh, speculating a lot. People certainly notice the monuments, they notice the visual culture, the big figures of kings and gods. They did by necessity notice the texts and because many Egyptian tombs, especially the non-royal ones, were meant to be visited because you needed people to remember you and you needed people to say the offering formula or even to bring you the offerings. But basically people were encountering texts a lot. Uh, however, not everybody could read. Some people were just passing by and using the presence of somebody else being literate and reading the text aloud to them. So there was one way of approaching the textual material you couldn't read yourself. The other, the other element was, of course, that people probably had some idea about what is a name or royal name or that a, a figure is accompanied by a name. And the other interesting thing, which we did mention also in, the, in our chat before going live, um, we noticed that um, the thing with hieroglyphs is really, really intriguing. Many Egyptians who are perfectly capable of writing hieratic administrators, accountants, they would not be routinely able to write and read hieroglyphs. These people who visited these tombs and temples very often evidently could do both. So they must have been quite a highly qualified category. Uh, there's a question here from Madin. There is a chiseled graffiti in the tomb of Tai at Saqqara. What could the difference be to a graffiti in ink? 
I think it's a kind of two questions at least rolled into one. Uh, one, the chisel graffiti in Saqqara, it's in T, it's in Mararuka, it's in Kagemni, and a, a colleague of mine, we're writing a paper together, Julia Hamilton of Oxford and now in Leiden, is working on this, and uh, another person who is doing a really nice work on this sort of reception of uh, Old Kingdom tombs is Gabriel Peak in Germany. Um, these chisel graffiti come probably from people who came to those tombs maybe even very soon after the tomb was finished. So they may be called more like staff graffiti or maybe family members graffiti. We're still discussing this and they're incredibly interesting. It's, it's a perfect question and a perfect point to make. These chisel graffiti are showing how the tomb lived soon after it was finished. So people came, worked there, visited there, uh, conducted the rituals. Now, the second part of the question is, what's the difference between something that's carved or chiseled and something that's written in ink? Well, you could suggest that uh, for writing in ink, you have to have your writing kit with you. But then many people who, who would be literate and would be roaming the necropolis for any sort of work-related reason would probably have their scribal kit with them. So the choice ink versus chisel could have been a matter of time. It could have been slightly, maybe marginally, faster to write an ink written text as opposed to the chiseled one. The chiseled one could have been considered more durable, but then in case of graffiti making, it was important to make the graffito. It was important to have it seen, to have it available to others, but also the very performance of making the graffito was important. So maybe the permanence of the graffiti was a consideration, but perhaps not primary. So uh, to sum up, it might have been a question of what tool was available, how much time did you have, and also sometimes, not necessarily always, whether you were outside or inside, what, was the, what were the light conditions? Because the chiseled graffiti are better seen on the outer walls, whereas the ink graffiti, especially the black ink ones, are seen, um, well, pretty much everywhere unless they're, they're damaged or, or faded. And they could fade more easily, perhaps in the sunlight and in, because of the exposure to the, to the elements, not just the sun, but sand as well abrasive sand driven by the wind when they would be used outside. So some technical considerations uh, as to outside, inside location could have also been at play when people were selecting whether they will use a subtractive technique, chiseling or additive technique, uh, ink writing. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. I think um, builders would be more likely to use chisels because they had them as tools. What you were talking about earlier reminded me of that kind of builder's graffiti when people are working on a house and they hide layers of art and then paint over it and things like that. Uh, this is a separate uh, issue. Uh, actually, it's two issues. Uh, workmen definitely leave graffiti and they leave them in uh, different settings. One, they leave them exactly, as you say, before the structure is even finished. So they leave them for practical reasons because they mark uh, this stone belongs somewhere, this stone was brought on the day, so and so. These so-called mason's marks, we find them uh, quite frequently in even in pyramid complexes and very frequently also in uh, non-royal tombs. So that's one part. It's like before the monument is even uh, finished, you can read the building history in graffiti. And then, of course, you have people who might have come as uh, uh, artists or, or, or workmen, trained uh, people, uh, who were interested in the ancient monument because they were using it for, let's say, as a, as a study object, as something to inspire them in their own work. And again, they might have been likely to have some of their tools with them. Is there any um, graffiti that accompanies destruction of the temples? So things like, you know, the, the smashed noses. Do you think there's a kind of spiritual or religious idea around the smashing of statues' noses? And was there graffiti that accompanied those kinds of destructive acts of vandalism? 
These destructive acts are quite uh, specific. For instance, the dismantling of an entire pyramid complex is not the same thing. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very Remicide, not exclusive to the Remicide period, but very typical of it, this kind of appropriation, material appropriation of the pyramid complex, but it's not meant to be like a damnatio memoria, like a destruction mm -hmm. of, the, of the memory of the pyramid owner. That's, uh, that's not the case. Uh, so those, like the dockets, the demolition dockets from Senusa III were in fact not a sort of purposeful um, attack on Senusra, they were just uh, dismantling. Uh, the, um, the smashed noses, they, it's very difficult to date these, these acts of, of destruction. Uh, so not likely that, it's not very likely that we would be able to date uh, an inscription and a destructive act like that accurately. Are there, um, uh, is there evidence of graffiti that does talk about destroying the name or the memory of someone or, or would that defeat the object because you'd then be writing the name again? <laughs> Uh, that would be defeating the object, yes, <laughs> not, not from ancient Egypt. However, people could destroy somebody else's graffito mm. if they really didn't like it, which seems to be the case, in which case they would destroy only the name of the writer, not the name of the king in the graffito. Great. Does anyone else have any other questions? Annette, I know that you wanted to um, say thank you to Hannah. So I've just unmuted you, Annette. Or oh, I tried to. Oh, yay. Haha. <laughs> um, yes, I have been asked on behalf of the committee to say thank you very much to Hannah for being our very first uh, lecturer to do a Zoom session for us. And also, I would like to say very much thank you to Sarah for being our host and being us, letting us be able to use your platform. And also to Angie for instigating Sarah to be our platform for this uh, uh, lecture today. So hopefully you've all enjoyed it enough that we will continue on for the uh, foreseeable future with lectures by you know by zoom because obviously we really have no idea when we can get back to face-to-face -to -face meetings yet and uh, obviously some people will still be not so keen to be mingling in public very soon so uh, thank you everybody hope you've all enjoyed yourselves today i know i certainly have it's been nice to finally get to do some egyptology for a long long time so thank you Amanda, did you have a question? Because I saw that you had your hand up. Or did you, do you have a question, Amanda? Um, no, I was just doing the clap sign, that's all. <laughs> oh, that's the clap sign. <laughs> Brilliant. If you allow me to say thank you for, for having me and for being here. And uh, well, I don't know if we have a sort of still a couple of minutes left for any, any question that may uh, pop up at the last uh, moment. Um, it was uh, very nice having the opportunity to talk to you. And Sarah, thanks for uh, being the perfect host. Oh, thank you. My pleasure. It was absolutely fascinating. And as I said, I'm going to put it on YouTube so uh, you can share this. I mean, I think this has got more than um, Egyptology appeal, really, because it really is a kind of cultural anthropological um, area of interest. So hopefully we'll get a lot of views on the YouTube clip as well. But yeah, thank you so much for everyone to come for coming along today. And uh, hopefully we'll do another one again soon. Thank you and have a lovely afternoon and hopefully um, a nice, more spring-like uh, weekend. Yes, thank you very much. I think I don't think anyone's going to have looked after, um, looked forward to a spring as much in decades because uh, spring being on the horizon does seem extremely exciting. <laughs> Indeed. Oh, thank you, everyone, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Thank you.